this something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was the <laughs>
In the House of Commons, they have an all-party parliamentary group that sits in the House of Commons, listens to some of the things that are being deliberated there, and then make decisions. Because they know that if you make a decision that could affect the customer, it affects you know, what happens in the economy as well. So that's how far they've gone. So for them, I wouldn't say that they have the mindset problem because the structures are there to make sure that whether or not you believe the business belongs to you, mm -hmm. this is what we want you to do, and that's exactly what you're going to do. If you don't do it, you leave. So their mindset problem is in there. The skill set. Now, if you look at things like communication, being assertive, problem solving, we need to be learning these things in schools. However, we're not. But when you go outside, these are things that, even if they're not being taught as a subject, it's being inculcated in the way they are being taught in school. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they won't teach you confidence as a subject, but you'll be asked a question and you'll be encouraged to speak your mind. Mm. And that's how you build confidence. So, they don't have the skill set problem. They don't have the mindset problem, mostly. Um, this is what the gap is, if you ask me. Okay. And the ownership mentality... Obviously, that doesn't come in as well because when they work for you, they definitely treat the business like it belongs to them. But that doesn't happen by accident. I mean, they've evolved over time. Exactly. Um, so if we were to prescribe a process to get Ghana's um, service quality um, to a certain level uh, beyond where we are now, how would we go about that? So I've set up my business. I've hired someone. I have agreed to pay them X amount at the end of the month. I'm fulfilling that part by paying them on time. What stops them from doing what they're supposed to do and own the business? You see, I said today that there needs to be a purge. Like There needs to be a total cleanse. Um, our standards are not correct. Um, the people who work don't have the right attitude. We don't have any regulators. The interest to even make sure that things are being done properly or correctly is also not there. If you look at all these regulatory bodies, they actually have... Um, their own little laws that is supposed to take care of the customer. Mm -hmm. However, the people that they regulate are not doing the right thing. But do you hear people being sanctioned for not doing the right thing when it comes to customer service? Hardly. So for me, I advocate all the time that when you're starting a business, instead of thinking about the money, capital, capital, I need a space, because most people don't even need the space that they're trying to get. They could do that business in their room on their laptop. Mm -hmm. Rather, spend time to educate yourself about the group of people whom you think you're going to be providing the service for. What do they need? How do you keep them happy? How do you anticipate their needs? So from the inception of your business, you understand your customer and you mm -hmm. grow with them. Unfortunately, that's not the case. People start off their businesses and they think, oh, I don't need to know anything about the customer. And then a year or two later down the line, you realize your customers start complaining and giving them trouble. So I would say for us to start and start right, with all the entrepreneurial courses and programs that we have going on now, customer service needs to be embedded in mm -hmm. these incubators so that people can learn who their customers are, what the right things are before they even start operating. We also need to look at how we can educate the younger ones mm -hmm. because it has to be a part of us. When I speak about the mentality, you don't just get up and have a particular mentality. It's something that you experience. It's something that you go through. That's what forms the mentality for right. you. So if we're able to go through our schools, maybe not even primary, but secondary school, and then start teaching concepts of customer service, concepts of ownership, concepts of confidence, concepts of communication, because those are the building blocks of customer service, I think by the time they're done with their three or four years, they would at least be 50% there. Mm. So when you're dispersed into the, the, you know, the work environment, you will be fine. You mentioned that um, you know, leaving here, moving to the UK, going to school, um, you recognize that some of the things that m are necessary to delivering service quality are not overtly taught, but it's somewhere along the line. And, and let me just, for the purposes of illustration, um, share a memory uh, I have of my first week in college in, 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 in England. Um, lecturer comes in, introduces himself, has a conversation about the course outline, and then gave us an assignment. Says, go do your research, and when you come in, <laughs> um, you do a presentation. This was week one. Yeah. Now, um, you realize that from the delivery of the assignment, there were those who naturally would be able to articulate their 
position on the subject matter, and some don't. Right from the very first week, this is what we're being exposed to. Without leading you, what I would like you to share with us is your experience from Akosobo International School and then going to um, the UK. Where do you see these nuances being different in the way you were taught? Right. Okay, so first of all, I think even from secondary school, there's a vacuum because it's never taught. So you go through secondary school being taught what they think it's, is necessary, not really what you need to survive in the workspace. But that's what we're all going to school for, to be honest, so that you can end up you know, making a living for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I left here, went to London. Uh, my first job was in a biscuit factory, okay. McVitie's, some, somewhere in Halston. Halston. Okay. And I remember getting that job. I was so excited <laughs> because, like, that's pounds. That's my first ever job. Yeah. I did that job for close to three months, and I got tired of it. And I said, no, I need to go and look for another job. So then I moved on to Primark. Now, that's where I had the eye-opener because Primark is pretty much um, very commercial for everybody. That's right. So a lot of people walk in there during the summer, and it was during the summer I started working there. The place is flooded, and imagine not even understanding how to work a till, but you're being asked to work a till, speak nicely, smile at the same time, and be efficient in what you're doing. For me, it was a big shock, because I've seen people in Ghana, four people do one thing, one person is taking this and passing to the next person. Mm -hmm. The other person is also giving you that. But here, you're like a one-man business under one roof doing the same thing. You're so answering customer queries. You're, exactly. You're scanning uh, barcodes. You're and bagging, doing all of and that. And you're expected to be smiling through the process. So just there, I realized, ah, there's something wrong. Mm. Why do these people behave this way? And why is it that we behave the other way? So throughout my work, I did a lot in retail. I did FCUK, Boonzoon. Then I went on to do NatWest, okay. um, National Westminster Bank, and then Santander. Now, that's where I had the eye-opening experience. Because moving through the banks, you realize that here in Ghana, a bank is a bank. Mm -hmm. And I think people have that mindset that we're only providing you financial solutions. And so we don't have to smile whilst we're giving you the money. We don't have to be nice whilst we're giving you the money. But it's a completely different story over there. In fact, even when they haven't given you their money, you have to be smiling. You have to be anticipating their needs. You have to be nice to them. You have to do whatever it is you can do to draw them in. Mm -hmm. So through the bank, I think that's where I... Obviously, I had matured a bit because I left when I was 17. I had worked in a few retail outlets, so I understood it more. And that's when I decided to be coming back home to Ghana. So the difference was clear. Right from Kotoka to a restaurant to a hotel, you can just see the difference all over. And it was there I felt like, hold on, I always want to come back to Ghana. And when I come, I want to do something that we need. I don't want to go into banking because that's the obvious. Everyone thinks because you've worked in a bank, you come back and settle. I said, no, I want to do something different. So that's why I started planning that this is what I want to do. And going back, I tried to shift myself in positions where I would be exposed to, you know, dealing with customer service and then solving customer service problems. Great stuff. Um, you know, when you talk about the eye-opening experience of working in the bank, having to work in retail, you're smiling at people, uh, you're doing all of these insurance, especially in the summer, I mean, in spaces like um, the retail uh, brands you mentioned, you'd have queues. Yes. Um, and you're doing all of these, answering people's queries, but you're also moving them along very quickly. Um, these aren't things that you naturally are born with. Um, Absolutely. What was the onboarding process like to get you to appreciate one, what the business represented, two, what you needed to do to ensure that the customers kept walking through the door. Okay, so if I compare the two, for example, when you are employed, first of all, when they're employing you, they want to make sure you have the right mindset. So it doesn't really have anything to do with your certificate. Okay. Whereas if you compare the two, over here, yes, you have to have a certificate. We're not checking your skill. We're not checking your mindset. We're not asking ourselves, can I change this person is this person willing to learn? Those actually are the most important questions we need to be asking when we're recruiting people. So for them, 
when they recruit you, they then let you in on who the company is. So you get to learn the vision, you learn the history, you learn their values and their mission. Things are slightly different here. You have people working in banks who cannot even tell you the mission of the bank. And it's on their website. They don't know what the, what the vision is. They don't know what the core values are. So over there, they would make sure they take you through all those things, get your buy-in. So it's not as if they're telling you, this is where we want to go. They're telling you, this is where we are taking you. So we're going together. We are a team. We're going to do this. We can't do it without your help. So from the inception, from the beginning, you feel important. So you start having the ownership mentality right from there. Mm. This is our business. I contribute to this. And it completely changes the way you work. So when you wake up and you're going to be late for work, you're actually affected because why? That's my business too. So their onboarding process is meticulous. They make sure they take you through everything you need to go through. And of course, they top it up with customer service training. But one thing that they do is they will set the standards, tell you exactly what would happen to you if you don't follow the standards. And if you don't, they get rid of you. So you know it's a cause and effect. So you have thing. the carrot and the stick. Exactly. But at least the, the framework within which you must operate is spelled out to you. Absolutely. Clearly. Absolutely. The desire to now make a career out of advancing service quality delivery um, started when you had all these experiences. Post your return, what would you say is the appetite for quality service delivery in Ghana? <laughs> I think the appetite, when you come to the customer, the customer yearns for respect. The customer yearns to be treated well. The customer yearns for that wow experience. But on the other side, organizations wish that their employees will do better, but they are not putting in the effort to make sure that the employees do better. So we are all customers at one point. So we know what it feels like to be treated well. We know what it feels like for someone to respect you, to be fair to you, to be trustworthy. However, when it comes to the appetite of those actually employing people, I think it's difficult for them mostly to invest in the people that they've employed. And that's, that's where the danger is, because why do you employ somebody and not equip, it, equip them with the right tools to get you or make your customers happy? Mm. Interesting point. So we're going to delve more into uh, a number of thoughts that's just jumping at me. Uh, and um, we're going to take a short break right now. When we come back, I'll be... Uh, finding out a lot more about service quality delivery and uh, how we can ensure that uh, businesses in Ghana are more profitable because when customers are happy, they'll keep coming back. The more they come back, the more money you make. The more money you make, the more taxes you pay. It's a cycle and we'll be exploring that. This is the Executive Lounge. I'm in Shirado, and there's more after this break. Welcome back. This is the Executive Lounge with me in Shirahado and my guest Yvonne Owe McCarthy. She's a service uh, delivery expert and the founder of the Institute of Customer Service Professionals. And uh, recently she's uh, also launched the Ghana Customer Service Index. We'll be getting into that in a little while. But uh, just before we went on the break, you talked about how important um, it is for us to embrace customer service and that at some point we are customers ourselves. Within the organization, um, this terminology of an internal customer and the external customer being the one coming to buy, how important if you had to wait customer service training at the business level, where would you place your weight in terms of building a culture would you train more for internal or will you focus more on the ex external or a mix? It's a bit like saying when your insights are happy, you will be happy. Mm. When your mental state is okay, you will be okay. So if I, for example, consult for a company, the first thing I want to do is look at their insights because anything can be polished to look nice, mm -hmm. but what's going on inside? So it's important if you want happy customers, make sure your employees are happy. If, you're on, um, if your employees are unhappy, your customers will be unhappy. So usually we feel like we've employed you, we're giving you the money, this is what you said you wanted. But don't think about the money you give them at the end of the month. What's their mental state? What's their emotional state? What's their physical state? Now once all these three things are working, 
you invest in them, you make sure that you genuinely mm -hmm. understand them and you pull them as part of the team, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have a problem going forward. Every business has a mission and vision statement. I mean, they're yes. displayed in the reception everywhere you go. Shouldn't that be enough to get people to appreciate why they're there? No. Those are words. It's the spirit of the company, but that's, those are words. So if you tell me your vision is to be the number one customer-centric organization in Ghana, yet for three years you have not trained anybody, how are they going to be customer-centric? They don't understand the thing about customer service. Mm -hmm. And even if you trained them three years ago, customer service evolves. You need to be training people quarterly, biannually, yearly, depending on the role or the responsibilities you've given them. So it's not enough. It is not enough to say that, oh, we've just employed people. They need to, or we've just told them what the vision is and the mission is and they should be okay. Once you tell them what the vision, the mission, the history and the values are, you make sure they are living by it and you're giving them what they need or you're equipping them to be able to live by the values and the missions that you set. So let me sound like the, uh, a cynic I once had that says, those who can't teach. You've practiced this, you've lived it, you've experienced it in your teaching, so this doesn't apply to you. But I would like you to give me a practical example of how you've had to dig deep to turn a situation around. I'm sure in your line of work, be it in the bank or even in retail, there are people who just are impossible to please. Yeah. And, and, and there isn't anything in the book that you can reach for and say, okay, this is the principle I have to use in this situation. Do you, have you had something for like my that? For my clients? Yeah, from, for you, in your life as a, a service provider or an employee of a business and even as a consultant now. I have it all the time. I, people still resist customer service. Wow. They'll tell you, I know I need it, but I think my people are fine. It happens all the time. So I always want to show you what's going on when you're not around. So with your permission, I can tell you, you know what, would you like to know what goes on when you're not there? Since you're so confident that your people are okay, you're resisting. So yes, yeah, some of them say, yeah, we will. So just when they're not aware, we might take a, a few you know, trips to whatever organization, do a mystery shop and come and show you. Because when you tell people, this is what I felt, mm -mm. this is what goes on here. So no, 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 there's no way this person will do that. Mm -hmm. But when I bring you a video, and you can see the person actually doing exactly what I said they did, then you'd believe me. So when I have difficult customers or people who, you know, sometimes are pushing here and there, I think for me, I always want to bring out what's in it for you. And that's how you sell to people. It's not what you can always offer them. What does what you have to offer them do for them? Or how is what you're going to offer benefit them? Mm -hmm. So if I can show you that by your, cust your employee behaving this way, this is what it's costing you. People like me will probably not come there again. And there's 10 or 20 of me who would not even speak. All they do is walk away. Once you can show them the effect of their resistance, it's easier to convince them. But sometimes um, for a lot of people, they become difficult also because they haven't had the experience. There's nothing to compare. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been outside, it will be difficult. I always say this. If you've not experienced good customer service outside, it's difficult when someone keeps saying a service is bad. You're like, oh, but they smiled. But mm -hmm. how did they smile? But they spoke. But what tone did they speak? What words did they use? What body language did they exhibit? So if you've been there before, then it makes it, you know, different. But <coughs> all in all, you have to be very, very intelligent and tactical in dealing with people, especially your customers. So in your life as an employee, um, that you've had to either overcome an argument with a colleague or being told off by the boss, something's happened, but then soon after you had to face a customer. How are you able to ensure that you were on point as far as your standards were concerned, in spite of what may have happened b before? Mindset. You need to set your mind up in such a way that when the door closes and your back door with your colleagues, hey, you can feel or do whatever. The minute the door opens, it's like you have, you know, camera ready action. Literally, that's what it means. That's how you have to start looking at things. You need to be able to act. And I'm not talking about being fake, but you need to be able to remove that problem clothing you're wearing, leave it in your locker room, walk out smiling, behaving as if you work for the best organization in the world to give out that kind of service. So it's a mindset thing. 
you need to consistently tell yourself, the minute I'm in front of a customer, you won't see me going down, you won't see me being rude, I'm going to give the customer 99.999% of my best service. Mm. It's a mindset thing, and that's how I've worked, I've worked around it. It doesn't matter what happens back door. I understand that the customer is king, the customer pays me. So would I go out and be angry with my boss? Of course not. So when I go out, I, I realize this is my boss. As a young entrepreneur, I came across quite a number of um, businesses and business owners who are either consultants or uh, running agencies, and sometimes they say, I fired a client. Is the customer always king, or sometimes the customer can be impossible to please? <laughs> they can be impossible. We're customers too. Sometimes we are impossible. You know, sometimes you expect a bit more. Your perception about that particular brand was quite high. And then they go and do something mediocre, and so you're like, oh, I can't believe this. So yes, customers are not perfect. Customers are human beings, first of all. But one thing you need to realize when you're providing a service is that customers will wear their emotions on their sleeves. They won't tell you, they don't have a relationship with you. So a customer can be going through a divorce, a customer could have lost a husband, a mother, school fees issues, they've lost their job. When they walk through the bank, through the hotel, through the restaurant, through the office, they're not going to tell you firsthand, do you know my husband wants to divorce me? What they do is act it out. So that person might be a bit stressed, behaving very you know, erratic, and then if you're not professional, you might begin to feel that you should also give them a dose of their own medicine. So you begin to mirror their attitude. Mm. And that's where you would have stepped out of the professional um, boundaries. Because at all times, so you should be prepared to but send I'm them. But I'm human too. Home. I may have lost my, uh, you know, absolutely. my house in a flood. Um, you know, uh, my girlfriend may be leaving <laughs> me. You know, we are human. We absolutely. have feelings. We have issues. And I know you did say earlier that, you know, you've got to be able to stay in the professional mm -hmm. zone. Mm -hmm. But how would you advise somebody who uh, may be going through a life-changing situation yeah. um, but are at work and they're on the brink of losing it? Should they show up and tell the boss, I don't feel like it today, or once they're on the floor, mm -hmm. they should be impervious, which is almost impossible, impossible to do. Yes. I think if you work with an organization that invests in you, that understands you, that cares about you, you wouldn't even get to that point where you would have to now be literally like crying for help. They would know. If, for example, you've lost somebody, they would even suggest you need to take a few days off because nobody stands in front of people and behaves correctly when they know there's someone they love, you know, dead somewhere. Yeah. So there are organizations that make sure that you don't even put yourself in a situation where you're exhibiting some of these things and then you can't even be penalized for it because you, it's almost as if you, almost, you have the right to behave the way you did. So if it's that serious, like a death, something that is you know, very, very serious, you let your supervisors know because it's better for you to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm in the right mental state to serve any customer than to go out there and really give the customer what you're feeling. Because that will not go just against you, it's going against the brand, the brand itself. We're, you know, you talked about ownership. Ownership is, um, for the lack of a better expression, uh, the fruits of empowerment. How do I, an employee, feel empowered? How, 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 does all, how should businesses empower people? You know, because I'm, I'm afraid maybe this person came in today. I know we make 10, 15 points on a product um, and they really wanted it. And so I approved, say, a 5% discount so that I could get them to buy multiples. Mm -hmm. Boss comes and says, but you didn't get my permission to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at that point, I needed to make a decision. How do people feel that, you know, my actions were taking with the business at heart yeah. and not feel that, if I'm treading on eggshells, if I did this, I might get punished for yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, when you want people to, to think, especially think out of the box, you need to give them more than the box. If you give somebody a box and you ask them to think out of the box, it's going to be different. You need to allow them. So CEOs, supervisors and managers, allow people to make decisions, delegate, mm. put some trust in them, show them you trust them and praise them when they do the right thing. 
because no matter how big your organization is, you can't run it on your own. Mm -hmm. One day, if you want to leave a legacy, you should run businesses that will run when you're not there. So empower people by your actions. You can't tell them, oh, I want to empower you. How mm -hmm. do you do that? It's not even about the money. No. It's about the trust and the faith you put in the person, the allowance that you give them. Now, I'll tell you something. I visited um, Facebook London about two years ago, and I keep talking about this because I then understood why Facebook is one of the top brands in the world. No one is telling you to come to work at 9 to 5. They've told you, we need you to be this productive. So you should have done A, B, C, D, E by the end of this week. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens? Some of them sit at home and they get the job done. They don't have to be at work. They have bars where they have alcohol. So I asked, are you serving alcohol at work? She said, yeah, sometimes clients come in and we want our employees to be free. But then they know not to get drunk. So they've been given the space to operate. And that's how, when you give someone the freedom they would operate in a healthy way. Obviously, you make sure you're guiding them so they don't go above board. But if you give somebody a box, you're stifling their creativity. And it's going to be very difficult for them to feel empowered. So allow people to make decisions. Once in a while, allow them to make mistakes. Correct them, pull them back in. Do it with love. But when you're doing that, get them to understand this is our business. Not my business. So for you, it seems consulting and helping businesses improve service quality was not enough. So you had to start the Ghana uh, Customer Service yes. Index. Uh, help me appreciate what the index is and, and why you felt the need to do that. Okay, so the, the index now is a national benchmark for measuring customer satisfaction each year. And we look at, last year we looked at eight sectors. This year we're looking at nine. Um, the retail is part of it, hospitality, telcos, utility, public sector, online businesses, tel um, telecommunications. So we had nine. Mm. And what we do is we had eight different matrix that we wind our questions around. Mm. So you have um, things like the look and feel. So we'll ask you questions about how you felt and what the place looked like when you went there. So things like branding, your logo, ventilation, do you have enough seats, the actual edifice, your colors, all of these enlighten. So we ask that, including the very people that work there, were they well uniformed or dressed? Um, were they appropriately dressed, the hair? We go into that detail. Then we look at the competence, professionalism, your customer-focused innovations, feedback and complaints. So we wind questions around these eight matrix, and then people give us their answers from zero to 10. We use that to work out what your position is. So we rate nine sectors, and under each sector, we have different organizations that we're also rating. Why is this important? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the question is, why isn't it important? Because as we speak, there is nothing currently in Ghana that benchmarks or looks at customer satisfaction mm -hmm. yearly. There's nothing. So organizations are just, we're operating in a vacuum. No one is competing with any, I don't know what you did last year. She doesn't know what I did last year. We only go with the perception of the customers who like us, mm -hmm. who say things like, oh, your service was good. No, how about taking something random so people can give you a true reflection of what they think about your brand. So it's important for me because, number one, we're tackling sectors and then we're looking at organizations that fall under these sectors. But most importantly, it was important because I felt we didn't have anything, any mechanism that collected data for customer service and okay. we want to start doing that. So now at least we have one for the year before, we have what we have now. And fortunately, there were a lot of trends, even though it's just been two years, you could see that there are one or two things that are beginning to be trends. And just reading through that, you'd be able to anticipate certain things that could even affect or change the economy that we're in currently. That's interesting. I mean, uh, it's brilliantly articulated because I, I was thinking, you know, when you talked about the existence of standards organizations for benchmarking and enforcing quality standards, um, I looked at Ghana and I thought, okay, well, we've got a Ghana Standards Authority and I'm sure there's a, <laughs> an, an international standards organization benchmark for service quality. But we don't have enforcement. Um, I remember in my... Um, study of advertising, um, you would know about the Advertising Standards Authority and yes. they receive complaints when people oh. think an advert, you know, had struck them incorrectly. 
an action was taken. Absolutely. You know, um, that they'd say, okay, this ad should never go on again. Um, there were some interesting brands, um, uh, 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 a drinks brand that was always um, in trouble because they, that was their approach, that yeah. they were always trying to shock people. Um, but the, the, all of this background is to say, in Ghana, we don't have, um, you know, where do I go to complain? Or maybe there are places, and, and, and mm -hmm. I don't see how this would. So for me, the customer, why should I be interested in a service index? Exactly. Um, well, I think there's a way we need to work and then build things up. Mm -hmm. Because this year, we had a lot of the organizations that were interested. I want to know, how did I do? If not for anything, it allows them to go and sit back because the report is a 68 page document of recommendations, trends, observations. And so if not for anything, there's a lot you can pick from there. Okay. And we've collated all of that for you to have a look, sit down, analyze and see how going forward you can learn to treat your customers better. Areas that you should improve. For example, we saw that um, a lot of the organizations, especially those that were bottom, utilities and public sector, didn't like doing business on digital platforms. They always wanted things to be done face to face. Now, if you look at where the world is going, artificial intelligence and technology is now the thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're still there, not wanting to move into technology, we can anticipate that in the next few years you're going to have a problem. So these are some of the things that actually come on. That's the benefit of it. It's quite interesting. I mean, I'm very, uh, I, I've never looked at the collection of data uh, as, 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 you know, applied in the sense that uh, you've described. How will technology affect the way we do customer service? And, and I'm talking about, okay, so today people, um, um, in, in, the, in the West, in the UK and other places, high street shops are closing down. Why? Because um, online. Online. Yes. Sooner or later, we'll get there. We do have services okay. online. We're there now. Um, what are the maybe three key things that an entrepreneur who's thinking about going digital have to put in place to ensure that the customer service that would have been uh, delivered if quality in person is translated into the digital space? Yes. I think, first of all, you need to sit down and analyze the type of service you need to be given. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain services that you really cannot go too technical with technology. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you're a solicitor, there needs to be that interaction. Because you're a, custom, you're a client then and not a customer. Mm -hmm. You've built a relationship, there needs to be trust. So even if you want to marry it with technology, you need to sit down and ask yourself, at which touch point do I want to bring in technology? Do I want our first meeting to be face to face so that there's a connection? And then going forward, I ask them to fill out their forms online. You need to sit down and strategize and ask yourself these things. Now, once you've asked yourself that, you need to then ask yourself, where exactly am I going with the technology? Because people have certain visions or dreams for their businesses. And for some of them, technology has to be wind into the beginning or inception of the business but they haven't done that now. Mm. So they run the business for three, four years now. Now they're realizing, hold on, I need to now incorporate technology into my job. So you need to ask yourself, at which point does this become very important to me? And then the third thing is, how am I going to make sure that technology becomes a benefit or a positive thing to me and not a negative thing? Mm. Because if you look at some of these organizations, let's even take, say for example, a bank. They have the bank running, which is the physical location. You go there, do your business. The website at 12 a.m. is my physical location because at 12 a.m. your bank is closed. Mm -hmm. So when I go onto the website looking for information, to me, that should feel like I walked into your bank and someone served me, meaning you should have enough information on there. Your, your website shouldn't be too cluttered. It should work. The interface should move. You should have enough things on there to, let, to tell me or give me the information that I need. So once we understand how technology is going to enhance the experience of our customers, we'll be halfway there. But most of the times, people don't get it. They feel like I can hide behind the website because you can't see me. So if you send me an email and I don't receive it, I won't answer. But if I send you an email and you don't answer, even if it's because you didn't receive it, I as a customer feel that you don't care and it's because you don't want to give me an answer. So it's very similar. 
And technology can either make or break with technology. If you don't do the right things, you'll be in trouble. Now, social media um, is a part of our daily lives. Um, brands are beginning to establish social media presence. Um, and Snapchat even has brand accounts on mm -hmm. it. Um, and, and customers are constantly talking about their experiences. How does a business get in front of ensuring great customer appreciation, um, not just in answering queries, but also in how people behave? Um, I think on a number of occasions there's been one errant tweet or the other that's created a big challenge for mm -hmm. organizations that's mm -hmm. led to CEOs, you know, resigning and, mm -hmm. and people, you know, losing money. What are the things that you think businesses must take into account when they're hiring people? I'm an individual. I have my own preferences, my beliefs and everything. When I'm tweeting on my personal account or writing mm -hmm. on Facebook, should I be thinking about the business? And how does the business get me to see how important my solitary tweet or Facebook post affects them, affects them and me in the long run? Absolutely. You know, when you start working for an organization, you now represent the brand. Mm. So regardless of where you are, you could be in London somewhere, and then someone would see on your page that you work for maybe one, maybe one of the banks. And then there's a picture of you with, you know, something in your mouth and drinking but then you know on facebook it allows you to speak about where you work or mm -hmm. to put that on there mm -hmm. so you've put that on there that's a constant brand on you constantly anyone who goes on your page if the five thousand people go on your page they know you work for xyz then they scroll into your pictures and they see you doing something contrary to what your brand would approve of wow immediately there's a problem even though it's your personal life when you walk now you are the brand. So it doesn't matter whether you are at work or not. People would always link you to the brand that you represent. So it's very important for us to watch our Facebook or social media footprints because even when you delete it nowadays, trust me, some people are quick. The minute you put it on there, they will take a snapshot of it and keep for future use. So mm -hmm. you've deleted it, you think you're free. Two days later, they're like, hey, don't you remember this? The and then you never forgets. It never forgets. <laughs> so we have to be very careful. Even though you're not at work, you still represent the brand. You know, in talking about people and their relationship with their businesses and uh, social media, um, f final thing I'd like to explore is, so the world is growing. People are making lots of money. Um, I think um, just yes, a few days ago, uh, also I was looking at how much some people make when they post on Instagram. Mm. Um, there are people it's making $800,000 plus by posting. These are influencers, celebrities. Yes. Um, okay, so we're fans of celebrities. We follow them on social media. So we suddenly are their customers. As an influencer and a celebrity, how are you supposed to ensure you are relating to your clients who are all over the world and in the multitudes that you're never able to really interact in, in yeah. you know individually with them. I think the beauty about social media is that you can reach out to people that you ordinarily wouldn't even be able to speak to so that happens naturally if the people have an interest in what you do they will automatically come onto your page and then you know have a look at it mm -hmm. but I think for you it's important to once in a while to interact not once in a while make it a consistent thing um, asking things like, what would you like to see? Because I've seen people, influencers asking, what would you like to see next time? And then they have a bit, you know, a, quite a few suggestions and people will tell them what they want or they can say, DM me with any problems that you have. Um, if you're on social media, because you don't get to see the person face to face, like celebrities, you have to be a bit more present. You, you have to be loud. Mm. And, and being loud doesn't mean you're putting, you know, very weird things out there. But every day you have to say something. Because there are, so many there are so many people on social media. There are so many influencers. So if you forget yourself for one week, guess what? I also forget you. Mm. Yes. So in order to stay connected, you've got to be in their face. And it's very similar to running a real business. 
that's why people advertise. If you don't advertise, they tell you you're doing business in the dark. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be in people's faces all the time, send out SMS blasts, put a billboard here and there, TV adverts. It's the same thing with social media. But I think the most important thing, if you really want to connect and do the right thing, be open to feedback. Because I've seen people, I mean, immediately their fans say something, oh, I think I didn't like this, hey, then they start talking down. It's mm. the same thing. Or they click the They click and button, they will right? block you one time. It's the same thing. It's just like you having a shop and having someone come in and say, oh, I think the light is a bit dim here today. And say, hey, walk out. You can't come and tell me what to do. Nobody Very makes, similar. You will make a profit that <laughs> way. We're going to take our final break Thanks. and we'll come back uh, with more uh, with my guest, uh, Yvonne Owee McCarthy. And uh, this is still the Executive Lounge. I'm in Shirado. There's more coming. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest, uh, Yvonne Owee McCarthy. She's the founder of the Institute uh, for Customer Service Professionals and also the um, curator uh, of the uh, Ghana Customer Service Index. And um, we've been learning quite a lot from you. We are in the back straight and uh, I often like to um, ask of people who are very passionate about a specific subject what they do to relax. <laughs> I mean, because you, you, you sound like you live and breathe service delivery and yes. you're constantly learning, but how do you live life apart yes. from customer service? I love to dance. Okay. I don't even know how to explain. I love music. I listen to a lot of music. It's, you know, very generous, but I love to dance. I, I love my own space. So, yes. So you lock yourself up in a room and dance? I can do that. Okay. I can lock myself up in a room and dance. I will dance when I'm out with people and I feel like the music is really kicking me. Mm -hmm. I'll do that too. But I love watching a good movie. Okay. If there's a good movie, I would get my drink and sit down, analyze the movie very well and then, you know, just enjoy it. All right. If you hadn't done what you do now, hmm. mm -hmm. what would you like to do? Probably be in the media. I've done... A bit of media, um, hosting, presentation, even radio, just a little. So I mm -hmm. think I'll probably have been there. Um, when I was much younger, in I think JHS1 or something, my terminal report said, this girl likes talking. Mm. And I think at the time, if my parents had paid a bit more attention to that, maybe they would have sent me to journalism school or something, <laughs> you know. But yes, if I probably wasn't doing customer yeah. service, I'll probably have, you know, swooped swayed into media okay well it's interesting it's all people's work isn't exactly it? you're still uh you would have still interacted with lots Absolutely. of different people and what you do well it's uh time flies when you're having fun um i i think we'll do this again uh, i think we'll do this again and uh, there's a lot for me to take away from this uh, thank you so much for thank you for time. having me sure. and uh, we will be reading the 68 page, page report to, yes and uh, see what we can learn from Absolutely. it but here for me are the five takeouts from my conversation with uh, Yvonne Owe McCarthy now number one is that you must have a keen sense of observation um, traveling and leaving the country um, exposed her to something different and she was able to distinguish between the service quality level um, elsewhere and what she had been experiencing here in Ghana. That observation, of course, led to the creation of her business and the customer service index. So observe, look out for the little, little things that aren't there and uh, you might just be on your way. Number two is uh, immerse yourself. Um, and, and when I say immerse yourself, Immerse yourself in the area of expertise you want to chart your course. If you want to go into customer service um, and you're studying something else, it probably pays to start jumping into some knowledge on customer service. And that knowledge is not only found in books, it's found in your own experience. It's the observations that I just talked about and the interactions that you have as you go along in life, but on discount books. Number three, passion. Um, for somebody who likes to be in her own space, uh, Yvonne clearly uh, lights up the room when she talks about service quality uh, delivery and, and the way she articulates um, a lot of what she's done and what she believes can be achieved. Uh, number four for me in all of this is that um, 
there should never be a time in your life where you stop evolving. And she talked about how constant training, investment in the people and in yourself constantly will prepare you for the changing world we live in. Uh, businesses are evolving every day. If you choose not to go digital today, you may be forced to go digital or forced out of business. And that's only because you either chose to evolve or die. Uh, so be ready to evolve, be flexible. The final thing in all of this is um, don't forget where you're from. Yvonne could have chosen to keep working as someone would say in Obimanso, somewhere mm -hmm. in someone else's country. But she took all the knowledge and the passion and decided that she's going to come back home and add value to her homeland. And this is a call to every single one of us here at home that may travel and those who are out of the country and in the diaspora. This is home. This will always be home. The lessons and layers of expertise that you have collected were not by accident. They were meant to make where you come from better. And on that note, thank you so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to always come your way. We're grateful for your company that you joined us. And thanks to the crew and uh, our friends at Villa Monticello. And finally, thank you. Thank you Yvonne, so much, Inshallah, once for again. having me. God bless you. Until the next time we come your way with the Executive Lounge, I'm Inshira Addo. As always, go forward, make rain. Shalom.